Okay, let's try this thing again. Uh, first of all, it's Tuesday, May 31st. Uh, you know, I want to stop just a second and say just this, that, uh, you know, I'm really foreign to, uh, to getting the feeling bad. You know, I mean, I, I've spent my whole life, I can't recall for all practical purposes ever missing a day's work, you know, by being sick. But, uh, and I can't imagine that the, the magnitude of a small little tick that could get on you that could cause a lot of issues and everything. But uh, I, I would caution everyone, take, take the, you know, a tick bite really serious and everything, and, you know, guard yourself, check yourself, make sure, you know, that we, you, you don't get into any of that, those issues. But uh, I, I really want to, I, I really want to thank, you know, all the people too, that, you know, the well wishes and everything, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable because you know, I, I just, uh, I've just never been sick before. And, and so, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's an unusual feeling. Maybe getting a little older is compounding the issue, but, uh, but nevertheless, I thank everyone and tickled to death to be back here with you. Um, we do have 36 additional deaths that have happened since the last briefing. And uh, 20 of those are reconciliations. So we really only had 16. Uh, 16 is way, way, way 16 too many, but at the same time, the number of deaths have really dropped off. The, uh, unfortunately, the number of infections and hospitalizations are moving up a little bit, but absolutely, let's right now, let's just take time to be really respectful of all these great 36 West Virginians that we've lost. The 6913th death is a 90-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6914th death, the 79-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6915th death, the 74-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 6916th death, an 86-year-old male from Lewis County. The 6917th death, an 83-year-old female from Wood County. The 6918th death, an 85-year-old female from Braxton County. The 6919th death, a 93-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6920th death, a 62-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6921st death, an 84-year-old female from Kanawha County. The 6922nd death, a 76-year-old male from Harrison County. The 6923rd death, an 83-year-old female from Boone County. The 6924th death, an 87-year-old female from Berkeley County. The 6,925th death, a 79-year-old male from Mingo County. The 6,926th death, a 72-year-old female from Wyoming County. The 6,927th death, an 86-year-old male from Ohio County. The 6,928th death, a 70-year-old female from Cabell County. The 6,929th death, an 81-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 6930th death, a 72-year-old female from Summers County. The 6931st death, an 89-year-old male from Raleigh County. And get this, and, and bless her in every way. The 6932nd death, a 101-year-old female from Wood County. What an incredible life. The 6933rd death, a 90-year-old male from Putnam County. The 6934th death, a 79-year-old female from Upshur County. The 6935th death, a 92-year-old female from Clay County. The 6936th death, a 75-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 6937th death, a 77-year-old male from Roan County. The 6938th death, a 77-year-old female from Harrison County. The 6939th death, a 71-year-old female from Raleigh County. The 6940th death, a 96-year-old male from Boone County. The 6941st death, the 6941st death is a 45-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 6942nd death is an 82-year-old female from Webster County. The 6943rd death is a 69-year-old female from Putnam County. The 6944th death is a 62-year-old male from Mason County. The 6945th death is an 84-year-old male from Ohio County. Now, if you thought 101 was a great, great, great ripe old age, get this one. 
The 6,946 death in West Virginia is a 107-year-old female from Berkeley County. God bless her in every way. The 6,947th death is a 76-year-old female from Barber County. And the 6,948th death in West Virginia is a 92-year-old female from Hampshire County. All these that we read, I don't recall reading a 50-year-old in the whole list, but we did read a 45-year-old. And that's tragic beyond belief. Please, please bless all these people in your, with your prayers and uh, reach out to their families and loved ones if you know them. And, uh, but if you don't, they'll some way, some way, they'll, they'll know of your prayers. And it's a very, very powerful, powerful weapon or, or mechanism that we have. The number of active cases in West Virginia are up to 2,184. The daily positive cases in the last 24 hours, 1,972. And that is really significant because we're home testing so much and we don't get that data here. Uh, our daily positivity rate's 11.65. Our cumulative rate is 8.13. The number of recovered cases are significantly over a half a million now, 506,793. We have 165 people that are hospitalized in West Virginia. That's up significantly. 23 people in the ICU and nine on ventilators. All of our county counties remain green and yellow. That part is good. You know, uh, <clears throat> you know, in regard to the national COVID cases, uh, as the U.S. marks Memorial, uh, marks Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start of summer, the seven-day average for COVID cases in West Virginia are more than six times what they were a year ago. Now, just think about that. You know, as we, as we go through the Memorial Day weekend, the seven-day average for COVID cases in the U.S. are more than six times what they were a year ago. Like I said, the infection rate is jumping the number of deaths are declining. The hospitalizations will probably increase, but absolutely what we're seeing is just this. We're seeing a variant that is more contagious and, and absolutely meaning that you're surely more apt to get it from the standpoint of the danger. If you're vaccinated, it's very minimal, but absolutely you should really consider the fact that if you're not vaccinated, the way this thing's running across the land and everything is awful good chance you're going to get it. Why go through the sickness? Why go through the sickness if that's the good result? Why expose yourself to a chance of, of a real chance of the possibility of death? Why do that? You know, absolutely, we know how safe these vaccines are, and we need you to really continue to think about that. Uh, Johns Hopkins just, you know, showed a seven-day average of 119,725 cases as a seven-day average, you know, you know, from the standpoint of what's going on all across our nation. I remind you over and over about your booster shot. You know, it's available to you, and absolutely you should be getting your booster shot. We still continue to make little, little, slow, but sure headway in everything. We're at 91.1% of those that are over 65. We're at 72.4% of those that are over 18, that are 18 and over that have received at least one shot. You know, we're, we're, uh, we've given out, we, we now have in the state of West Virginia, 978,747 folks that are fully vaccinated. You know, we continue to lag a little bit behind on our booster shots. We've got to absolutely follow up on that. The vaccine calculator will give you the information if you'll just get signed up as to when your boosters are due and all that and everything, take advantage, please do. All the other stuff as far as free testing and all the information's up on our website in regard to COVID. 
We have 63 outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. We have none in our church community, 17 inmate cases, and 25 staff cases. I remind you about the rental assistance and the homeowner assistance program. They're available for you. It is really significant dollars. And you should, all you've got to do is call, call us, walk through a few questions, and see if you can qualify. I mean, what's the harm? It's real, real, real money to you, to our state, and everything. Take advantage. Please take advantage. I ask you over and over about giving blood. Couldn't possibly be more important. And just check with your physician and and get their blessing, and then uh, if you can do so, think really hard about doing that. We added a couple new schools. The last, you know, on last Monday, we were, you know, I was at uh, Wheeling Park and, uh, and at the Clay Battleton Middle School. Uh, both of them, you know, we added from the standpoint of game changers working within the schools and working, you know, on drug prevention and and, and, and really just a, and more and more and more intense evaluation, you know, uh, or intense uh, knowledge to all those around, you know, from the standpoint of the, the, you know, just how they can combat this terrible drug epidemic. You know, I, both, in, in both places, the Wheeling Spark School is an incredible, incredible school. Uh, you know, a real diamond in the rough for West Virginia, there's no question. But the Clay Battleton Middle School was, uh, you know, just, uh, it was amazing. The turnout there and how mannerly those kids were, it was, it was really something. I mean, that's just all there is to it. You know, all those, all those folks at, at Wheeling Park and Clay Battleton, you know, just, uh, you know, they should be very, very, very proud and everything because they're doing incredible work. But those kids were absolutely just so respectful. So absolutely wonder, I shook the hands of every single kid, every kid at Clay Battleton. And uh, just, just good, 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 solid kids. And they're, they're on their way to doing more and more and more goodness. And so if we, if we can help them with programs like Game Changers and everything, it's absolutely we want to be able to be able to step up and do exactly that. I was honored when they asked me to be the head coach. And uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep swinging for the fences to try to do anything and everything we can possibly do to help our kids. You know, this is amazing, but we continue to break state fish records in West Virginia. We have now had two more record state fish that have been caught. You know, one of them was a carp, and, uh, and, it, and it measured 41.2 inches long. You know, it was a little shy on the weight. It was 45.2 pounds. And the, the, the current state record is 47.0 pounds. And so it became a new state record on the length of the fish. But it, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, in this state, we produce some real record fish. And the other, well, the other one was a trophy uh, blue catfish that was just caught. The record weight prior to this was held by Cody Carver just only seven weeks ago. He caught, a, he caught a blue cat that weighed 61.28 pounds. And, and, and uh, let me get this right. This fish that was caught, you know, and, and I don't have the gentleman's first name here, but I, have, I, I guess, I, oh, no, I do have. His name is Steve Price. And Steve caught this fish. Now get this, get this. This fish was 50.8 seven inches long and weighed 67.22 pounds. Cody's fish was a new state record at 61.28, but Steve blew past that in a magnificent way and everything, but that is a fish, fish, fish. And so we keep, we keep doing it in West Virginia and breaking records. We want anglers to come to this state it's um, unbelievable what we're doing with our trout all across the state, but uh, lots of good stuff happening, lots of great opportunities in West Virginia. Now, I need to comment to you about this, and I need to just share with you my heart and my feelings. You know, what happened, you know, at that incredible grade school or elementary school 
you know, Robb Elementary School in uh, Uvalde, Texas, was, there's no word, there's no adjective to possibly describe. We all know the tragedy is just off the chart. And we all clamor and we say, well, let's do an assault weapons ban or let's do this or let's do whatever, you know. We all want to do something. But the reality from my standpoint, if you want to know my heart, it's just this. And it's not good. It's not good because I worry so much that in a lot of ways, uh, if you just step back and just think about one thing, just all you got to do is just think and say, you know, if you're 50 or 60 or 70, say 60 or 70 years old, just think, how were things in America really 50 years ago? And have we regressed or have we, you know, gotten better? Well, I think in most people's eyes, we'd have to say we've regressed. From the standpoint of crime and from the stand standpoint of all the problems with mental health and all the different things that are going on across our country, uh, it's not good. It's just not good. And are things going to get better? Well, they're not going to get better until we take a comprehensive, all-in approach to what's going on. I mean, if you just step back and just think about just this, uh, think of the basically pornographic materials that our young, young, young are able to have access to now. Think about the violence in video games that, that we continue to promote to our youngest and our youngest. And we absolutely are, are so obsessed by, by the fact that, you know, that, well, we can just pump anything out to our youngest and everything because we have that freedom. We can just, we can put out the most violent games or whatever, all the different things across social media and just things. And, and we expect, we really expect that some way, somehow, our youngest are going to be able to grow up. They're going to grow up and they're going to be good citizens, all of them. We're not going to have situations like this. You're kidding yourself. You're just plain kidding yourself. Until we're willing in this country to take an all-in, all-comprehensive approach to what's going on, and we're really willing to use good logic and good sense, these tragedies will continue. Now, it tears my guts out in every way. Can we do more to protect our schools without any question? Should we do more to protect our schools? We should do anything and everything to be able to some way, I mean, put more officers in the schools, put all kinds of more safety, you know, features again in, in our schools. We should do anything and everything we possibly can all the time to protect our children. But we got to think about what's going on in this country. We got to think about what is going on all across our land. Are we really and truly, I mean, letting young men grow up and be young men? You know, and not feeling very good, you get to watch a lots and lots and lots of TV and newscasts and over and over. Ask yourself this. Just ask yourself about the brave men and women that charged the towers when the towers had been under terrible attack. When they were running up those steps, in all honesty, did they really think that this would be their last day? Probably they did, but yet they were willing to run. They were willing to, still willing to run right into the fire to try to save us. So many instances now, we don't have people that are willing to run to that fire. 
You know, we are creating a society every day that is very, very concerning to me. So with all that being said, I pray for these beautiful, beautiful children and their families. I can't fathom it. I just can't fathom it. It just kills me to my soul in every way. We've either got to step back and really truly believe that we can do a comprehensive all-in some type of approach to make things better. And if we don't, things are going to continue to be tough, if not real bad, and if not get worse. And that's what I think. I salute in every way we had a potential tragedy right in our midst here in Charleston, West Virginia. We had someone with an AR-15, you know, opening fire, and it just so happened that there was a lady there that uh, was a gun owner and just happened to have a gun with her and took him out. Praise the Lord for her in every way. Like I said, as far as school safety in West Virginia, I'm all in 1,000% to try to do any and everything we possibly can, possibly can to make it safer and to make it better and everything else. We have so many issues today that are, are being caused only by ourselves. So many issues where, where people, whether it be the drugs or the violent videos are on and on and on, the pornographic, the social media, no matter what it may be. I mean, it, that's why I coach really and truly, and I urge all public officials to do something with kids, some way step up and do something with kids. Do you realize how they are bombarded with really tough stuff? No wonder we have the mental issues that we've got all across our land. I mean, we can't even possibly keep up. No wonder. But if you can take time, even though it hurts, even though it takes away time from your family, even though it absolutely takes away your playtime, if you can take time to do something with kids, do it. They absolutely need you so badly right now, it is off the chart. And very, very quickly, very quickly, before you can bat an eye, they're 18 years old. And if they're troubled beyond belief, then look what happens. Last thing I've got is an announcement, you know, that uh, we, we, have, we are receiving $72.1 million from the U.S. Treasury Department. It'll be basically, for all practical purposes what it is is venture capital money for small businesses you know and it'll be handled I, I guess uh, you know through the job investment trust and that will be moving to EDA and uh, but at the same time you know we'll let you know more about this program as, as more stuff you know comes on and uh, but that's 72.1 million, million uh, I'm sorry 72.1 million dollars is going to be coming in into our state, and uh, and you know we'll have uh, we'll have a lot of great opportunities for additional entrepreneurs in West Virginia. So that's good stuff. That's all I got right now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Governor. We'll now hear from Jeff Sandy, Secretary of the West Virginia Department of Homeland Security. Thank you, Governor, for your statements that you made concerning the tragedy in Texas. I'd like to assure the West Virginia citizens that the state of West Virginia and our federal partners are doing everything possible to ensure that our schools are safe. We would like to, first of all, start with some basics. And that is, if you see an incident that is occurring, it is your patriotic duty to dial 911. Please do that, 911. Secondly, if it is not an immediate emergency, we encourage you to call, and the number is on the screen, 1-866-723-3982, and that works out to be 1-866-SAFE-WVA. 
that number is managed 24 hours a day, seven days a week by the Department of Homeland Security and the Division of Emergency Management. That is so important. In addition, there is an email available, which is also on the screen, safeschools at wv.gov. And now I would like to talk about the Prevention Resource Officer Program in West Virginia. Since Governor Justice took office, our schools that have wanted a Prevention Resource Officer, commonly referred to as a Pro Officer, it's, they've received 2.7 million. In the last year, it was $1 million uh, that was received. In the PRO program, as a former Wood County Sheriff, it is an excellent program, not only to keep the school safe, but also it gives a mentor for the uh, young people at the school to understand the role of a law enforcement officer. And the great stories that have occurred the past five years across the state of West Virginia by the heroic acts of our pro officers in our school. And they, there's, they're countless how the pro officer was able to intervene and to stop a dangerous incident from occurring. And to give you an example, Huntington uh, uh, Police Department uh, had one situation in which they were able to intervene and keep a, uh, uh, a tragic event from happening. So I want to assure the public that the Justice Administration is doing everything that we, in our power, and one of the things in which is our excellent partnership with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. To date, over 7,000 individuals, primarily school teachers, have received uh, training on what to do if a tragic event happened at their, uh, at their school. And that a total of 96 entities, mostly schools, have been involved. And in August, we will have four more uh, shooting uh, training events in West Virginia. And if you are interested in attending one of those events, you can contact the Charleston office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation or contact uh, the Safe Schools number, which uh, was on the screen, and they will direct you to make sure you can participate. So, Governor, thank you so much for what you're doing for Homeland Security. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good morning, and uh, it's certainly wonderful to see you, Governor, back in good health, and, and I share your concern with Secretary Sandys about the absolute tragedy that we saw in Texas, but that we've seen at other schools in our country as well. The schools are places where our children need to feel safe and our parents need to feel safe as well, so we appreciate the outstanding leadership here in the state of West Virginia. When it comes to COVID, we know that the um, additional subvariants of the Omicron um, form of COVID-19 have become the dominant uh, form in the United States. The BA2.12.1 variant, which is about 25% more infectious than the BA2 variant and about 30% more infectious than the BA1 variant is the dominant variant in the United States. In West Virginia, we've had such few cases that we have been uh, have obtained through testing that we are, are continuing to try to understand what our dominant variants are. Um, they were the BA2 variant, and we are presuming that is still the dominant variant, but we are continuing to look for um, positive cases that we can sequence so that we can update that for West Virginia. It is of uh, some good news that our RT value seems to be going down. It went from 1.13 to 1.06 to today 1.02. And, and that implies that some of the transmission may be slowing from the Omicron variant of COVID-19, but this should not make people feel 
um, suddenly like there's, you know, the risk has gone away because as we said earlier, the RT value is also dependent upon the testing that we are able to document. And for the current surge the, that is going on around the country and for the increased cases we've seen in West Virginia, we have not been able to track that very well. We are close to 100,000 average cases a day in the United States and really smart authorities think that we are picking up probably as few as five to 10 percent of all positive cases that are circulating. It is also of note that our hospital numbers have gone back up a little bit. And as the governor said, we are about six times higher in the number of cases at this point in 2022 than we were at this point in 2021. Remember uh, at this point in 2021, we were sort of uh, feeling good that perhaps we were going to get a long respite from COVID and that's when the Delta variant occurred for us and, and caused many, many problems. And so it's important for us to be highly um, vigilant about uh, protecting ourselves and making sure we are fully vaccinated. We once again report that the vaccine calculator is an important adjunct both for, for individuals in West Virginia and also for healthcare providers to make sure that we are actively updating our vaccinations uh, and that all people know when and which vaccine they should get to be fully up to date with their vaccines, which still remains the strongest protection from hospitalization or death. But it's also important to recognize that if it's been a while since you've been vaccinated or if you're older, the risk of vaccine breakthrough with the Omicron variant is is higher because of the incredible infectious nature of the Omicron variant. So also important for our older folks and also people who are immunocompromised to just be careful when you're in large crowded indoor environments and consider either not in the, being in those environments right now or wearing a high quality face mask if you're going to do that. Um, as we continue to uh, commit to our main goals of this uh, COVID pandemic response, which is to save as many lives as possible, uh, protect uh, the health and well being of our citizens, maintain our hospital capacity, and help keep our state together. We're really proud of the job that people in this state have done, but the, um, the focus is not done yet. And it is important for us to continue to do the things that we've done that have help, helped us to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next to retired Major General Jim Hoyer, the director of our Joint Interagency Task Force. Good morning, and Governor, it's good to see you back and feeling better. Uh, I'd just like to reinforce some points that the Governor and Dr. Marsh made with some, uh, some data. Uh, as Governor pointed out, we continue to see an, a regular uptake in vaccines, both first doses as well as uh, vaccinated and, and boosted. So uh, at his direction, we will continue to press forward with that because we know how important it is. And just to highlight, uh, that uh, and particularly among our older West Virginians, we are seeing more outbreaks uh, in, in uh, nursing home facilities and our older West Virginians. You can, uh, again, pay attention to the ages of the individuals that uh, uh, the governor's pointed out that, that we've lost. And we know that hospitalizations uh, are up to 165 and a lot of those are older West Virginians. So we've got to continue to press that for that reason. But also uh, we have three therapies that are still available uh, to us based on the variants uh, with Paxlovid being uh, probably our most important right now. We are ordering the maximum number of doses that we can uh, for Paxlovid, but we know if we have significant outbreaks, those numbers will not be what we need. So reinforcing what both the governor and uh, Clay have said, our best line of defense is to continue to vaccinate. Uh, creating that, that immunity within our systems is the most important tool that we have available to us. Uh, a couple other items I'd like to point out, we have lost 22,000 uh, U.S. veterans to COVID. Uh, 
so we will continue to uh, again focus on our older uh, West Virginians and we will pay a particular effort to uh, to continue to vaccinate and boost our veterans as as we go forward at the governor's direction. Uh, also, uh, this is the last day of Mental Health Awareness Month. We know that COVID has had a significant impact on mental health, not just for those who have experienced, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, COVID or deaths in their family, but also our children and others who have dealt with the various uh, challenges that we've faced as a state and a nation. So I encourage West Virginians who are having mental health issues or concerns uh, that you can reach out to Help 304 and uh, there are resources out there to help you. But uh, again, to all West Virginians, we've got to continue to press forward with vaccines and boosters because that is our best defense uh, for COVID going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next is Secretary Bill Crouch with the DHHR. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder that uh, DHHR will publish uh, the child welfare dashboard beginning tomorrow. Uh, that will have information on child placements and referrals, uh, as well as uh, additional information. Uh, as I've said before, this will be a living document. Uh, we will make changes periodically as we have with the COVID dashboard to uh, improve the information on the dashboard or add to information on the dashboard. Uh, we will update it monthly and uh, we welcome the uh, feedback with regard to uh, that dashboard and, and we'll uh, look forward to uh, uh, suggested changes. That dashboard is located on the DHHR dashboard. That will be dhhr.wb.gov. That is uh, www.dhhr.wb.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Dr. Anam Jada, State Health Officer, is also joining us today and is available for questions. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Stephen Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Hello, Stephen Adams with Ogden Newspapers here. I'll, I've got two questions. I'll make them quick despite my reputation for long questions. But the first one's to the governor. You mentioned a lot of broad uh, topics there in regards to dealing with uh, gun violence. Uh, and, and addressing that in different ways. Uh, I'm curious as to know if there were a chance for you to call a theoretical special session and bring lawmakers in. Is there one thing, and obviously it wouldn't solve the problem or it'd just be one small thing, but is there one thing that uh, you or the legislature could do tomorrow? Uh, one small thing to in regards to the issue of, of gun violence, that would be easy to do and not cause you any political problems. And second question for uh, uh, for Secretary Crouch, with the launch of this dashboard, if this has been asked before, I'm unaware, but the legislature obviously did try to pass a dashboard that was taken out of uh, the bill that ultimately did not pass the session. I know you all had uh, kind of pushed back and you might push back on me for that character, characterization on a dashboard that the legislature was working on. Why did you decide to go your own route uh, with this dashboard instead of working uh, directly with the legislature for a bill to do such a thing? Thank you. Stephen, let me, let me answer your, you know, your question that was directed to me first, but, uh, and then we'll go to Bill. But Stephen, from the standpoint of, uh, you mentioned is there, is there one thing you can do that wouldn't cause you any political problems. Well, listen, Stephen, you got to understand this really loud and clear. I've never given one hoot about the political problems. All I've ever tried to do was do the right stuff. The reality of this whole thing is this, is, you know, just absolutely putting a, a taking an aspirin for cancer is no, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to cure anything. From the standpoint of how do I feel about assault weapons? You know, well, first of all, I mean, do I really feel like that an 18-year-old ought to be able to walk in and buy an assault weapon? I don't. I have, but, but from the standpoint of a 21-year-old, you know, you know, it's a, different, it's, it's, it's a different thing. You know, to me, the age ought to be 21. But from the standpoint of just this, Stephen, 
this situation is so complex, it's unbelievable, and people are not going to do anything about it until we address the whole. The whole is really absolutely just simply just this. You know, I mean, just, just think of what is going on all across America today. The crime wave is unbelievable. People, people, you know, we're, we're saying to people, if you, go, you can break in any store, you can break in any house, and you can take whatever you want up to a certain value, and we'll just slap your hand a little bit and turn you loose tomorrow. And a lot of those people have big-time mental health issues, and a lot of those people are carrying guns and everything, and they're in your house. Well, absolutely, you may very well need an assault weapon to be able to protect your house. Just what this lady just did the other day, you know, that could have turned into a problem beyond belief. This situation absolutely is way, way, way too complex to just say, well, let's just do this or let's just do that. So we can absolutely say we did something. At the end of the day, you've got, you got a lot of factions that are going to be fighting in many, many different ways to be able to stand up on a soapbox and say, I did something. I'm the guy that would say, I, I would gladly, gladly in any and every way welcome an overall discussion of logic, a discussion that would center around lots and lots of different things from the standpoint of drugs, from the standpoint of our border crossings and all the fentanyl that is coming right in on top of us and we don't do anything about it, do we, Stephen? We absolutely know the mental health issues today are rampant. Why are we not doing something about it? We absolutely know, without any question, uh, to me at least, that why in the world is an 18-year-old buying an assault weapon? You know, a 21-year-old, I'd welcome it. But really and truly, we know, we know all of the stuff that's going on on social media all across the land. We know of the profanity. We know of absolutely all the different stuff, you know, all the porn, all the bad stuff that's out there that is getting in the minds of our children. We know all these violent video games that are out there getting in the minds of our children. Why don't we do something about it? Every day we say, oh, we can't do anything about that. You know, that's these people's rights to do this and everything. Before you know it, you know, one of the, one of the broadcasters on TV said, you know, as a criminal, you know, uh, violates some law, hurts somebody, does something that's really bad, we're going to have to send a limo to go pick them up. Then we're going to stand up and scream, defund the police. You know, it's, it's terrible, and it just, it, it just kills me to my soul. You know, uh, if we don't do something about this and everything, we're going to have more of this. And then we're going we're to all get up in arms, and we're going to act like we're going to do something, and we're not going to do anything, and then we're going to have more of it. You know, it's... Uh, not with Jim Justice are you ever going to be able to say, cause him a political problem. Jim Justice doesn't give a hoot about a political problem. He never has. You know, we got big, big, big problems here, and we best better get at, at trying to address the big problems, the absolute big problems. But uh, nevertheless, Bill, I, and I'm sorry, Stephen, your question was very, very good and, and deserving and... Uh, but, but, you know, uh, Bill, please answer the rest of it. Thank you, Governor. Um, certainly there was, uh, we were working with the legislature, first of all, during the session uh, on, the, uh, on the legislation to create a dashboard. The appearance of any pushback uh, probably had to do what was, with what was on the dashboard, what was being proposed. Child welfare is a tough, tough issue uh, for a variety of reasons. One is the confidentiality of, of those children. We were very, very serious about making sure that our children are cared for adequately when they uh, come under our care and that information about those children uh, is not released. So I, I think that was probably the issue there. Uh, we, have, uh, we have created a dashboard that is probably not going to satisfy everyone. What was uh, ended up in the legislation was very comprehensive. And uh, we may get to 
that point with a lot of information or will get to that point with a lot of information. In fact, uh, as Dave, we discussed last week uh, that legislation and what we could include and not include initially in the dashboard. So uh, we're rolling this out. To, uh, I have always been uh, supportive of a dashboard and supportive of providing public information out there. We haven't done enough in terms of child welfare. We haven't done enough in terms of, uh, of, of children staying in hotel rooms and, and children staying in DHHR offices and bringing our children uh, back into West Virginia uh, who are going out of state. And uh, I'm confident with uh, Commissioner Pack that we're going to tackle these things. That board is a part of that in terms of what we're doing. It will provide that information in terms of out of state, uh, our out of state children. Uh, by state where, where they're located. So we're gonna get those numbers down. We're now gonna focus on this issue and, and make some progress on this issue. So it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, our highest priority in DHHR right now. So, uh, but the dashboard's part of that. We'll make sure everyone has uh, the opportunity to, to uh, have their comments heard or their suggestions uh, reviewed. And uh, again, just like the COVID dashboard, we're gonna change this as we go forward to provide uh, important and valuable information to, to the public, to the legislature, and, and to reporters out there. So thanks for the question. All right, thank you, Stephen. Next to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, everyone. Governor, good to see you back. Um, this is a medical question on uh, maybe intermediate COVID um, and uh, the impact that the disease may have on your immune system. Now, I don't know if it'll uh, account for Lyme disease, Governor, but uh, I'm uh, I'm wondering, and, and I've gotten a lot of impact from friends. Um, I have four different friends who had cataracts had gotten much worse because after they had had COVID. Is there any uh, study out there that would confirm that uh, we're looking at COVID implications beyond cardiac event uh, and, and things like that? Uh, Dr. Marsh, I guess you would go first. Thank you. Go. Yeah, let me just let me just say this to Paul. Paul, you know, if a, if a tenth of what I hear is legit, you know, I I would have a very valid concern. You know, from the standpoint of there's lots and lots and lots and lots of people that believe. There's lots of doctors. There's lots of of all the medical community that believe that there is ramifications all across the board for, for long-term issues or whatever it may be from lung or heart or, 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 or all, everything. I mean, you know, people that, are, are, that, that have had COVID are having a, a repercussion of a lot of different things. And like I said, if a tenth of it is true, you know, and I had the opportunity to still get vaccinated and to absolutely prevent maybe the possibility of me getting COVID, I'd be at it right now. But anyway, Dr. Marsh, you know way more about this than I, but uh, please just take over. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Paul. Certainly a recent study from the Centers for Disease Control um, has I think given us the best information on the question you asked, Paul. So they found that in people that did not require hospitalization, about 20% of people that had had COVID below the age of 65 suffered some symptoms that would be consistent with long COVID. And, um, and about 25% of people not requiring hospitalizations over 65 um, also experienced these long COVID symptoms. If people needed to be hospitalized and were really sick with COVID, those numbers jump up to 40 to 60%. So ultimately having had COVID before does absolutely impact your immune system and many, many other systems, including your energy, your heart system, your brain system, your lungs and lung systems. So ultimately, we know that long COVID is a, an increasingly um, uh, common manifestation of COVID-19. And as we look at the impact of vaccines, we see that vaccines um, in earlier studies with other forms of COVID had about a 50% uh, 
benefit in reducing uh, the risk of long-term COVID findings. In this recent study, that um, benefit was lower than it was for previous um, variants of COVID-19 in the 15 to 20% range. But we know that the severity of the illness absolutely impacts the likelihood of getting long COVID. And we know that the vaccines um, are very, very good, as General Hoyer pointed out, the governor's pointed out, in reducing the severity of illness. And that is true still with the Omicron variant. So getting vaccinated uh, is the best protection uh, and being up to date with your vaccinations if you get COVID-19. But the best protection is not getting COVID-19, which is a multiple strategy um, number of things, including being up to date with your vaccinations and also trying to reduce your exposure to very crowded indoor environments without wearing a mask, particularly if you are over 50 years old. And remember about 95% of our cases of, uh, of COVID that result in death are in West Virginians and Americans over 50 years old. So important to be up to date, also important to protect yourself, but certainly reducing the risk of severe disease also reduces the risk of long COVID and vaccinations also reduce the risk of long COVID. But with the Omicron variant, that protection, if you just have mild disease, is not quite as significant as it was against the Delta variant of COVID-19, at least based on this recent study from the CDC. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Next to Megan Bashera with WCHS and WVAH. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Megan with uh, Channel 8 News. Uh, I have a question about the child welfare dashboard uh, along with that 15% pay raise for CPS workers. First governor, um, where did the state be able to find the money for that pay raise? And also Secretary Crouch, what specific types of information could we expect to see on that dashboard? Thank you. It's, it's Megan, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, Megan, thanks so much for your question and everything. Megan, what we did in finding the money for, the, for those positions and everything, those, uh, that 15% pay increase, which is incredibly badly needed. I mean, we really need to absolutely help all those folks in every way. And those folks are doing incredible work and we need to encourage and be able to recruit and get people into the system. That absolutely without any question, what we did was we had all kinds of vacant positions that people weren't, weren't even applying for. And so when we gathered up those vacant position dollars, you know, we were able to solve that riddle and, uh, and, and, and be able to take care of those people and, and, and increase that pay raise. But, uh, you know, Secretary Krause, I, there was another part of the question, you know, please, uh, please, you know, come back on that. All right, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and I want to thank the Governor again. He is the one that made this happen. Uh, that this, uh, that, 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 uh, as with the dashboard, the same piece of legislation, or I'm sorry, same piece, same bill that had the dashboard information had, had an increase for our CPS workers, and that bill didn't pass. And we don't need legislation to do the dashboard uh, or to do the raises in this case because the Governor uh, changed, some, uh, changed some language in the budget bill to allow us to use money from vacant positions. So uh, again, thank you for that, Governor. Uh, in terms of what's on the dashboard, Megan, uh, we're we will have, uh, it will have child placements by county, uh, by type of placement, and, and that could be uh, in the home of PRPF. Uh, it could be in a resident care facility. So we've broken that out so that folks can see exactly where these, uh, where our children are. Uh, it, it has out-of-state placement uh, by state, so we'll know uh, where those children are uh, by state, and it has work, workforce information, which may be the most important information. We track this uh, almost daily in terms of our workforce, and, and you'll see, um, and it's broken down by district, our district offices, and by county, so uh, you'll be able to see where we have issues with regard to our workforce. Workforce is DHHR's biggest problem, right? Being able to hire uh, employees, CPS and other employees, is uh, is becoming more and more difficult. So, as the governor said, these folks are absolutely crucial to what we do. They're they're so important to to the system. They're heroes taking care of children every day. Here are some negative things about DHHR. And again, folks who who talk about DHHR uh, 
being broken. That's not true. The HHR is not broken. We take care of hundreds of children daily. We take care of adults uh, who need our assistance and a variety of other programs at the HHR. So uh, we, we want to make sure our, those folks are, are, are given credit for the good work they do. Uh, there are heroes out there, and, and we appreciate what they do. And as the governor said, uh, this is uh, an increase that, that is important and, and needed by these folks. So uh, thank you, Megan. The dashboard will be up tomorrow. And again, uh, uh, looking forward to seeing comments on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Megan. Next to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the two bids the state has received for the DHHR assessment. Um, first of all, could we talk about the timeline for when we hope to award that bid and when we expect whoever we pick to get on the job? Um, second, um, Secretary Crouch previously said the bid scoring was going to be done by um, you know some kind of outside impartial group. C could you tell us a little bit about who those folks are and how they were selected? Thank you. Okay, Secretary Krauss, you know, if you, you'll take this, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I've stayed out of that process. I've, I've, uh, I've had an arm's length uh, kind of uh, uh, part of that uh, role of making the determination of, of who gets the bids. The information is available um, on the purchasing website in terms of the two complete uh, bids uh, uh, documents that we received, the two proposals. The documents, as I understand it, uh, were opened Friday, uh, the bid portion of the documents in terms of the pricing. That information is also available. So I really only know what I've seen on uh, uh, from those two websites. Uh, the individuals who uh, do the scoring, uh, that was arranged in the governor's office. That uh, those, those individuals are generally not uh, made public who they are. But again, none of those individuals were uh, are employed by DHHR or have a, 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 any responsibility with regard to, to DHHR other than their state positions and their roles in government. So uh, that was all separate and, and, uh, and, and distinct from, from DHHR. So I hope that helps. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Charles. Next to Curtis Johnson with WSAZ. Hello, Governor. Thank you so much for uh, taking my question. I want to go back to the Texas school shooting, and I was intrigued by some comments you made multiple times talking about the need is for an all-in comprehensive approach. I'm interested in knowing when do you take step one to getting to that approach? Is that a special session? If it's not a special session, again, when do you take step one? And then when you start looking at that comprehensive approach, what's included in it? Does it include armed guards at all schools? I know PROs are at several schools, but I don't think they're at every school. Also, are you going to codify the 21-year-old uh, uh, provision to buy guns? Um, I guess the assault, the assault rifles. Um, what's your thoughts on that? It was, is it Mark? Is that correct? Chris. Curtis. I, I'm sorry. Curtis. Chris, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Chris, let, let, me, let me just say this. Stephen Adams said, you know, just a second ago, uh, or posed a question and said, you know, uh, and, and, I, and I made the note that, that it could cause, what is, the, what is something that could be done that would cause the least political problem? You know, really and truly, what I'm trying to say to everyone is just this. That is the whole issue. That's everything. You know, you've got politicians running all over this place, politicians running all over D.C., and all those politicians are going to first and foremost say, what is, what is this that I'm going to propose? What is it going to gain me, or what is it going to hurt me as a politician? That's the problem. That's the bullseye. Really and truly, if we don't grow up and wake up in America to the fact that absolutely what we've got is a bunch of politicians that want to continue to do stuff that perpetuates them as politicians, and we don't wake up to the fact that we have a serious, serious problem. Now, in my world, in my world, and it wouldn't get to first base, 
but in my world, you know, what I would do, and I just made these notes as we go, you know, this is what I do, I, you know, make all the notes as we just continue down, down the pathways. But in, in my world, my world would show up as to say, okay, let's stop all the porn that our kids are absorbing every day. Stop the stuff that's going on on social media that is absolutely deteriorating their minds, worthlessly deteriorating their minds. Stop all the video violence that's out there that is absolutely doing the exact same, th same thing. Let men, let young men start on the pathway of being and growing up into being men. There's nothing to be ashamed about, about young men growing up into being men and protecting, protecting women, protecting kids, protecting people. You know, absolutely, in my opinion, we should amp up the mental health programs because there are so many problems across this country. It is off the chart, off the chart. And we've got to step up and do just that. I do believe that we could increase the assault weapons, you know, the, the being able to, to purchase a weapon that has a, a bullet clip of 30 or 40 or 15 or whatever it may be from 18 to 21. Getting an, to have an assault weapons ban in this country, we don't need that. We don't need that. And absolutely on top of all that today with what's going on all across our land, from the standpoint of crime and everything, we surely to God above need to be able to protect ourselves. And the Second Amendment, if there was a time on this planet that there is a need for the Second Amendment, it's now. Without, I, you know, I wrote just down a couple more things real quick. How do we expect, you know, there's an old thing my dad used to tell me all the time, don't ever expect more than you can inspect. How do we expect with the drug situation, with the border situation, just letting anybody and everybody into our country, how do we expect things to be better there? How can we possibly expect that? The only other things I'd add is I'd just do just this. I'd, if, if, you know, this business of saying, well, the jails are full, so therefore we're going to lessen the penalties, lessen the penalties and everything. And now we can't, we can't put people in jail for doing something bad, so we just turn them loose. And what do they do? More bad. And we turn them loose again. I'd build more jails. I would build more jails and continue to build more and more and more and more jails. And people that are doing stuff bad, they'd go to jail in my book. And the last thing I'd do is I would absolutely do anything and everything I could possibly do to make things safer at our schools, whether it be more armed guards or whether it be absolutely all kinds of different things that we could do, but not make it to where our kids were invaded by the fact that a school ought to be the place where they, they love to be and they feel safe and they absolutely they want to be there. It is so important to the fabric of who we are but if we don't look at a comprehensive plan such as something like this, we're not going to get any better. And we're just waiting for the next terrible thing to happen. And absolutely, if with, in all, with all in me, we can call a thousand special sessions. But until we as people start thinking logically and reasonably as people, and we're willing, we're willing to do stuff, and everything, instead of looking at how is this politically going to impact me, we won't get to first base. It will be a total waste of breath and time. We will not get to first base. We better, we better get at realizing that. You know, I can call a thousand special sessions. And if all I'm doing is calling a thousand special sessions for people just to come and talk and get up on a soapbox and get nothing done, why? And, and it's 10,000 times worse in Washington, D.C. It is a situation that grows worse every single day. And, and with all in me, 
It, I hate it, and I hate it so bad. It's just, I hate it off the chart bad. Because I know it, because you see, I am that guy that's been in the schools. I am that guy that's been with the kids. Over and over and over, I am that guy. I'm not a politician that just thinks he knows. I know. And I know what our kids go through. And I know how our kids have changed. And really and truly, uh, I'm not optimistic. That's all there is to it. And I am absolutely the most optimistic person around. But in this situation, I'm not optimistic. All we're going to do is just talk and have a bunch of rhetoric and everything. And at the end of the day, we're probably not going to get much done. All right, thanks, Curtis. Uh, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Well, I've said enough. I've said enough. You know, really and truly, uh, I appreciate all the well wishes and everything, and, uh, and I feel great. You know, I, I would caution everybody about being in the woods and, and everything and being in areas, if, you, if you're in areas where, you know, ticks could be, watch yourself. Uh, you know, we got, we got lots of issues, but West Virginia is doing terrific. And I can tell you that the DHHR is an executive branch, uh, you know, function and everything, and we're, and it didn't get in this situation overnight. This, is, this has been decades and decades and decades of, uh, of, of just, you know, kicking the can down the road and doing everything under the sun. You know, the one thing we don't want to do is spontaneously do something like I referred to and all this other stuff to where we just up and do something and then have a Jeffro Bodine moment, moment where we, oh my gosh, what, are we, what have we done? We've lost a bunch of federal funding and we can't qualify for it and we hurt a bunch of people and everything. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to go with this uh, systematically. We're going, to, we're going to have the folks, you know, that are going to come in and do a top to bottom evaluation and then we're going to make things better. I mean, that's what, that's, that's what we've done across the board since I walked in the door and that's what we're going to continue to try to do. So that's all I got. Thank you so much.